Oh, please, after you get seated, I uh, still wanted to remind you that we have evaluation forms at uh, every desk, so take some time to fill those out. It's a pleasure to introduce this morning Paul Nantulia, who's currently the Peace Building and Governance Manager for CRS in Sudan. Um, Paul, to put it mildly, sports a very, very impressive track record of both resolving disputes and circumvent as well as circumventing conflict through peaceful negotiations. Um, Paul's academic credentials very briefly. He holds a bachelor of arts degree in international relations from the United States International University in Kenya. And he also holds a Master of International Humanitarian Law degree from the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. He has been involved in Sudan as a student activist, a policy analyst, and a scholar for more than a decade. Prior to joining CRS, Paul worked at the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, also known as ACCORD, a leading peacekeeping organization based in South Africa. Paul also coordinated an international panel of conflict resolution experts that provided technical support to several constitutional processes across Africa. In addition, while at Accord, Paul was a member of a team that supported the South African mediation of the Burundi conflict. And between 2004 and 2006, Paul's work took him to Cape Town, South Africa. During this time, he worked extensively with the Rwandan Ministry of Justice and the Rwandan National Unity and Reconciliation Commission. As a personal aside, um, I think at a time when our country is, is assuming an increasingly more like posture worldwide, it's important for Christians to remember that it's the peacemakers and not necessarily the victors who are called the children of God. So it's a real treat to have Paul with us today who can hopefully show us a way to move toward that Christian moral ideal of peace. Welcome, Paul. pleasure, a privilege, and an honor for me to be here uh, today to discuss with you very briefly um, the activities of CRS uh, in the southern part of the Sudan, uh, which is where I'm based, working with my colleagues uh, in the agency uh, to support uh, that country, to support that society, to attain uh, peace um, and justice. Before I go into my presentation, uh, I would just like to give, for three minutes, a context uh, that will help us understand how the conflict uh, in the Sudan, it's, a, it's been the longest running conflict on the African continent. Uh, Sudan is the biggest country in Africa, um, which borders a number of countries. Uh, it is a bridge, at least the Arab world and Africa. Uh, it has a particular um, history, and the ways in which that history, uh, events in that history have played out, have determined to a very significant extent the ways in which uh, conflicts play out in the country. When we go down the corridors of history, uh, to the 4th century, the 5th century, in the geographical space that is now referred to as uh, modern Sudan, uh, we see two major streams uh, of thought, two major streams of thought, two visions that have been clashing violently and struggling to determine the destiny of the country. One of those is the African nationalist stream. The other is an Arab nationalist stream. As we said, Sudan is a bridge between both worlds. Um, and historically, you have, you have had uh, African uh, uh, societies, predominantly in the southern part of the country, in the western and the eastern parts of the country, and an Arab society, uh, predominantly in the northern parts uh, of that country. And that characterization also uh, in that uh, conflict. Now, Sudan, like the United States, is a multi-ethnic, it's a multi-racial, multi-religious, it's a very diverse uh, uh, society. Unfortunately, uh, those diversities 
have not been harnessed in a manner that has created uh, a common home where all these different identities coexist in a peaceful way. Uh, and it has been tragic that the history of the Sudan has been characterized by a broken relationship between the African nationalist stream within Sudanese history and the Arab nationalist stream. Um, so these are the two models that you have uh, developing in the country um, historically. Then you come to independence uh, in 1956. And there is a failure on the part of the political elites to define uh, a common, united uh, uh, framework that can bring these diversities together. Uh, that is in 1956. So what you have emerging are two distinct uh, but conflicting entities. You have uh, an African uh, entity based on uh, resistance, violent resistance and peaceful resistance, uh, predominantly in the southern parts of the country. Uh, so that is one uh, political entity uh, that you have developing at independence. Then, on the other hand, you have an Arab, very strong Arab, Arabized uh, uh, political notion or political entity. Uh, and both the failure uh, to, to, to move or to negotiate uh, uh, a new basis uh, in which these identities can coexist in a peaceful manner leads to the outbreak of the first civil war, uh, which actually started a year before independence. So the war in Sudan started in, in 1955. That was a year before the independence uh, arrangement. So this is what you have. Um, so from 1956, you had a series of uh, peace accords, failed peace accords, uh, the 1972 process. There was a process in 1964 and so on. Uh, but none of these initiatives uh, succeeded in creating this, uh, this new uh, commonality uh, that, uh, that uh, peacemakers in Sudan have been calling for. So the neighboring countries, uh, specifically Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, Eritrea, launched a very ambitious peace process in 1994. Uh, and in that peace process, what we had was the possibility of bringing these two models together into an arrangement uh, that is referred to as unity and diversity. So you have an African uh, entity and an Arab entity, but you also have a peace agreement, uh, which was signed in 2005 between the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, which has been the predominant uh, rebel group uh, that has predominantly been based in the south, and the government of the Sudan, predominantly Arab, which has been based in the northern parts of the country. So this unity and diversity model is what exists. It's a very fragile model. Uh, you have a government of national unity in the center that is based in uh, Khartoum, and then you have a government, an autonomous government, in southern Sudan. Um, this is the model that is currently existing. Now this model creates possibility creates the possibility for two scenarios. The preferred scenario is that the unity arrangement will lead to a united Sudan. Now when the peace agreement was signed, uh, an interim period of six years was provided for. Um, and at the end of the interim period, the southern part of the Sudan will vote in a referendum where southerners will decide whether they're going to remain uh, in this model um, or move to a united Sudan or separate. So these are the three possibilities that are created uh, by the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And if that model of unity fails, then Sudan will go back to the separation model, where you will have an African uh, 
entity in the southern part of the country that will be recognized as an independent state. And then you will have an Arab entity in the northern parts of the country that will also be recognized uh, uh, as an entity. The difference between this model and this model is that in this model it is assumed that this arrangement will be done through negotiation, through a referendum, through a political process. And at least both entities will have, will have, uh, will have experience in uh, living within uh, a united arrangement. But this model is a violent model. It's a model that is not based on compromise. It's not based on negotiation. It's really based on either one of these identities seeking to dominate the other. So if you look at, if you look at this, you have a predominantly African model with an Arab you know, imposing itself over an Arab uh, minority, uh, which is unsustainable. And the opposite is also true, where you have an Arab predominantly Arab model imposing itself uh, on an African entity. These two models, the comprehensive peace agreement uh, argues that these models are not sustainable. So this just gives us a context. Uh, of course, it's much more complex than this, but at least it will give us an understanding of the kind of challenges that we're dealing with in this world. So that is one aspect of, uh, of the conflict. And I will make these uh, uh, models available. The other aspect is the sheer size of the country and the complexity of the conflict creates many situations in one country. If you look at how conflict develops, this will be duration, and these will be incidents. Typically what happens is that conflict will start, it will, it will rise. And at some point, you know, these are violent incidents occurring over a, a particular period, period of time. And after a while, it will settle. <coughs> so if there are no peace initiatives uh, or mediation initiatives, after a while, conflict settles and it becomes static and resistant to resolution. The Sudan conflict has followed this model. Uh, and one can, can look at it from two halves. Uh, at this point uh, in the graph, one is looking at uh, peace, uh, peace, uh, peacekeeping, uh, peace enforcement, political negotiations, and so on. This is, a very, this, is a very, this is the political aspect uh, of conflict uh, management. And at this stage, we're talking about post-conflict reconstruction. And those are efforts that are put in place to decrease conflict and stabilize society. This is where CRS peace building uh, operations uh, you will find on this side of the, of the, of the graph. So you have uh, economic measures, um, transitional justice measures, uh, and so on. Now, this is just a schematic. Uh, it doesn't explain the complexity, but it's just a schematic. What is peculiar about the Sudan is that you have different conflicts taking place at the same time. Some of those conflicts have been resolved, like the broader North-South conflict, which was settled by the peace agreement that we talked about. But you also have other conflicts in the western part of the country, in Darfur, um, where there's an extraordinarily high amount of violence, and the peace agreement uh, that was signed is failing to hold. And you also have conflicts in the eastern parts of the country, um, which are yet to be resolved. So for any peace building organization, so that is an extreme challenge, because um, one is dealing with one particular set of conflicts in one part of the country, but bearing in mind that uh, conflicts continue to rage in other parts of the country. And that becomes a very difficult uh, uh, scenario to deal with. So this is just a... Uh, okay.
so like we said, uh, it's the biggest country in Africa. It's about a quarter, a quarter of the size of the United States. It has a population of 34 million, uh, similar to California. English and Arabic are the main official languages, but there are many other languages that are spoken in the country. As we said, it's a very diverse um, society. The racial groups can be divided roughly into those who identify themselves as African and those who identify themselves as Arab. And the you have had is you have had a series of uh, governments based in the northern part of the country that are predominantly uh, uh, or almost exclusively um, Arab and uh, various, a whole range of opposition movements that have predominantly been based the southern parts of the country. But uh, the western parts of uh, Sudan and the eastern parts of the Sudan and the parts in the extreme north at the border with Egypt also have rebellions uh, that are yet to be uh, resolved. Like we said, if you look at the countries that surround the Sudan, you have countries like Uganda, Kenya, the Central African Republic, and Ethiopia, and Chad. These countries have predominantly intervened in the conflict to support uh, the rebels uh, in the southern parts of the country. Whereas the countries to the north, uh, countries like Egypt and Libya, and other um, uh, countries in that region uh, have intervened in the conflict on the side of the government. So this is one conflict that uh, can potentially cause a very serious rift between Arab-speaking Africa, North Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a, very, it's a conflict that has um, uh, a very serious, very serious implications um, for the rest of the continent. It has known only 11 years of peace after gaining independence in 1956. So like we said, you've had a series of peace agreements, uh, failed peace agreements in the Sudan since 1956. Uh, more than 2 million people are believed to have been killed and over 4 million uh, displaced, both in the Sudan and in the neighboring um, countries. The second civil war, uh, which erupted in uh, 1983, was ended in January 2005, following the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And it was in the process of uh, settling this conflict that the war in uh, Darfur uh, broke out. But what is important to note is that the crisis in Darfur and in the other parts of the Sudan should not be seen as isolated. They should not be seen as separate because they are completely and wholly connected uh, to the bigger problem in the Sudan, which is a problem of a perceived marginalization on the part of groups that feel that they're not included in the uh, governance arrangements. Uh, of the country, perceived neglect, and uh, perceived uh, injustices. So the question of Southern Sudan is completely linked to the questions in Darfur and in the eastern parts of the country. So that is just a brief um, overview uh, of the conflict. I think we went through that. So, under the terms of the CPA, as we mentioned, two governments were formed to work together. A government of national unity in the northern part of the country, which brings the belligerents together, and an independent government uh, in southern Sudan, which also has a challenge of establishing um, a new constitution, a new governance arrangements, and uh, so on. Now, in terms of the years to come, the things that have to be sorted out, which haven't yet been uh, agreed upon are how the oil resources, especially in the border regions of the Sudan, will be shared. This is one of the stumbling blocks currently in the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. We have elections coming up in 2009, and CRS is, uh, is part of a, a coalition of international agencies um, that are trying to ensure that uh, civic education takes place and that the, the laws um, that will govern the elections are put in place, and that the population is educated about their rights and responsibilities. Uh, then in 2011, 
uh, there will be a referendum in southern Sudan, during which the people of southern Sudan will be given a choice between unity and uh, partition. So it's quite a radical departure, um, uh, at least in terms of uh, African uh, international relations. Those of us based in Juba do see some changes uh, ever since the signing of the CPA. There is some investment coming in uh, to the country. Uh, the government of southern Sudan is trying to establish laws, is trying to put in place a constitution, uh, an independent parliament, and so on. There were no precedents for this in the past. And we see that security, by and large, um, has improved. So there have been some positive changes uh, since the signing of the, of the peace agreement. However, wars continue in Darfur and the eastern parts of the Sudan. Uh, this region sits at the border between northern and southern Sudan. It has um, the biggest concentration of oil resources in the country, and it's been a flashpoint of conflict, of tension, uh, availability of weapons, and uh, political tensions continue uh, between the protagonists, between the SPLM, SPLA. Even though there's a government of national unity, it will take time because, like we said, these tensions are historical and they've been there for, for several years. What is peace building? We look at peace building as the process of re-establishing peace after it has been disturbed. Now, I'm not sure if that's a baseball. We try to look at it in that way. And how do we build peace? Certainly, in the context of the Sudan, how does CRS build peace? We basically do it through two, uh, our programming, our peace programming as an agency, covers two broad areas. One is to strengthen institutions, institutions of government, and so on. But it's not enough to strengthen institutions. It's also important to work with individuals within those institutions in order to strengthen relationships. For instance, you have a government of national unity that brings together former enemies. Even in southern Sudan, in the government of southern Sudan, um, you have different uh, southern-based political parties. Some of them were enemies, some of them fought during the war. Factions emerged. Uh, so you also have quite a diverse arrangement in the southern part of the country with people who have to manage these institutions, uh, who yesterday were shooting at each other. <coughs> so this is a very, very important uh, uh, aspect uh, of CRS peace building. And the overall objective is to change unjust structures through building right relationships. And our tenets, uh, certainly those that guide us in the Sudan, um, is integrated programming, partnerships at every level of society, and support wherever possible to existing peace structures. Uh, CRS has been working in the Sudan since 1971, implementing programs in a number of areas, water and sanitation, agriculture, food security, education, including peace education, governance, and peace building. All these programs are integrated. Uh, we don't pursue these programs in an independent way, because uh, if we're talking about creating conditions where uh, society <coughs> such as the Sudan is able to build peace and stability, one cannot approach these programs in, a, in, a, in an isolated way. In terms of actual peace building, uh, CRS has been doing this since, consciously at least, since 1999. Um, and our focus has mainly been on three levels. Uh, since the signing of the peace agreement, the government of Southern Sudan fortunately has established a peace commission whose responsibility it is to intervene in conflicts, to bring warring uh, parties together, and to promote the peace building agenda uh, as provided for by the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. CRS is very active in supporting this institution. CRS has been working this, with this institution even before it's established, uh, during the war, during the years of war, when the, the rebel uh, movement that was going to become a government uh, uh, was trying to think about 
the governance arrangement, the peace arrangement that will hold the country together after the signing of the peace process. The CRS is extremely proud to have been part of the process that worked with this group uh, to develop the ideas uh, that were eventually passed into law leading to the establishment of the Southern Sudan Peace Commission. So this is one of our strong partners in Southern Sudan. The other important institution is the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission. Uh, during the years of the war, the Catholic Church uh, could, not, could not be based inside the country uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so most of the work was done out of uh, Nairobi, but CRS was instrumental in uh, assisting the structures of the Catholic Church to re-establish themselves back in uh, Southern Sudan. And one of the uh, 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 crucial parts of that intervention has been to help the church to reorganize its justice and peace um, commission. And you have these commissions in all the 10 states of uh, Southern Sudan. CRS also works very closely with the United Nations mission in the Sudan, uh, particularly around uh, the peace councils um, that we're working hard to establish in different parts of the country, uh, and also in terms of monitoring and oversight to ensure that the peace agreement uh, is implemented and respected. There are quite a number of things that we do um, on the peace building track. But I will just mention, uh, because of uh, time, I'll just talk about one particular program, um, which is a, uh, it's a very comprehensive peace building at the Eastern Mennonite University. This is a program that runs for an extended period of time, bringing together leaders from government, from the churches, from communities, from civil society. And our primary focus is to develop skills, and techniques, and tools uh, that leaders from these various levels uh, will require to first of all understand and engage proactively in peace building and conflict management. So in terms of the curriculum, the curriculum covers five key components. The first component we look at is conflict management in terms of its theoretical and practical uh, application. We look at transitional justice. We look at issues of memorialization and how memories are, are, and how memories uh, can be handled uh, to ensure that the protagonists are able to 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 humanize their former enemies. This is a very important aspect uh, of the program. We look at stereotype reduction, how stereotypes are formed, and how stereotypes can be deconstructed. We look at trauma healing and reconciliation. And we also look at mediation. So these are the uh, elements that are covered. Uh, we have a faculty uh, bringing together specialists from the Eastern Mennonite University um, and African specialists from the region. So we have had we work with colleagues from Rwanda, from uh, South Africa, from different places uh, to bring to bear experiences that would be relevant uh, for the Southern uh, Sudan. A key aspect of this program is the development of peace councils. Uh, CRS working together with the UN, working together with, uh, with, uh, with government entities, uh, has spearheaded the process of establishing peace councils and peace committees in different parts uh, of Southern Sudan. Uh, we're also working very closely with the Southern Sudan Peace Commission uh, to help the commission establish a conflict early warning and response mechanism. Uh, because much as uh, the peace agreement has been signed, you continue to have conflicts in the southern part of the country. And so it was felt uh, that it would be, it would be important, uh, at least for this commission, to develop a mechanism through which it's able to identify conflicts and to intervene before those conflicts become um, crises. That photograph there, this, this is the first group of, uh, of leaders that we graduated after the first nine months, last April. These leaders come from uh, different walks of life. Some of them are uh, members of parliament, some of them are governmental advisors, some of them are ex-combatants, uh, some of them are priests, some of them are from the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission. They're from all walks of life. And we also we were also very fortunate to have all the 10 state directors of the Southern Sudan Peace Commission. And that enabled CRS to have, a, to have an outreach because there are 10 states that were established in Southern Sudan. And each of those states has uh, a peace commission. So uh, it was a very, very, it was um, a very, very comprehensive program. And uh, CRS was able to work with the same group of leaders over the course of nine months.
So what you then have is uh, relationships that are being built, that are being developed, and at the end of the training, um, we've been able to see positive change. Um, some of these uh, uh, graduates are able to advise uh, the state governments on these issues. Many of them are called to actively resolve, and we've documented several cases of, act of active conflict mediation in different communities and societies. Uh, so this is one of the uh, programs that, uh, that CRS runs. These are just some of the uh, reflections. Um, Beatrice Ogat, who is a, uh, a Minister for Social Development in the eastern parts of, uh, in, the, in the state of Eastern Equatoria, um, was one of the um, uh, participants uh, that uh, participated in this uh, particular program. Her daughter was killed uh, by the Lord's Resistance Army, which is a uh, rebel group uh, that is based in Uganda, but which is also active in Southern Sudan. Uh, at the end of the training, she was able to, um, uh, I'll just read it, the trauma in me has been released. I had hatred towards my offenders, but now I've forgiven them, and I raised my head. She has engaged on a very personal and moving journey. Uh, where she, she, she's physically met her perpetrators, forgiven them, and actually taken them in as part of her household. Um, these are just some of, them, some of the stories uh, that we're now starting to hear in, uh, in uh, southern Sudan. One of the reverends, uh, currently working for the Lutheran World Federation, uh, said that the training affected his life so much and helped him understand himself. He is now um, in charge of... Uh, peace initiatives for LWF in that, in that part of the Sudan. We're just extremely proud and extremely honored uh, to have trained uh, students that have been able to take up very senior positions with NGOs, with government authorities, and this is just part of uh, CRS's uh, small contribution towards having a pool of, uh, of people uh, who can be called upon uh, to resolve conflicts in the different parts of, uh, of uh, Sudan. In addition to that, uh, the agency supports three peace councils in the state that are actively uh, resolving uh, and mediating conflicts, uh, working very closely also with the State Peace Commission, and uh, more recently, uh, in collaboration with the United Nations, CRS has been able to set up a steering committee bringing together all the peace actors in that part of the Sudan um, to collaborate, to share information, uh, to intervene proactively, to address conflicts, to do research and documentation, uh, and also to expose the Sudanese peace actors to peace initiatives in other parts of the African continent. Uh, in January, this uh, program is going to be moving to the, to the region of Abyei, which, as I mentioned, is a region that borders northern and southern Sudan. CRS felt that it was very important uh, to move this uh, training program uh, to Abyei in order to try and bring about some sort of accommodation uh, between the groups in that part of the country that either identify themselves as Arab or African, it would be a very important um, uh, contribution uh, towards building a vision of a united Sudan, uh, as it should be. And why should, why should we care about what happens uh, in the Sudan? <coughs> First is uh, solidarity. Uh, for CRS, solidarity is extremely important. Um, because the conflict in the Sudan is not just a concern for the people of Sudan, but it's also a global concern. Um, it's a global concern. It's a conflict that touches all of us um, in different ways. Uh, so we see solidarity as an extremely important uh, tool, as an extremely important aspect of the kind of work that we're doing. We're quite proud to have in Juba, in the southern part of the Sudan, working for CRS, a multinational team of people drawn from different parts of the continent, different nationalities, and different parts of the world who are working behind a vision uh, of bringing peace uh, to this very remote part of the world. Secondly, resources, support, capacity, which is uh, required to ensure that uh, the Sudanese are able um, to think about a different alternative uh, vision for their country, 
to think about a united country that is able to heal uh, the very violent history that the country has been through. Um, so we see this as extremely important. Third is to help end the war in Darfur. Uh, and we, we do acknowledge that there has been, a, there's, there's a lot of lobbying going on right now about the situation in Darfur. There's an outrage around the world about the kind of things that are happening in Darfur. CRS does have a program in Darfur of about 150 staff, <coughs> building schools, looking after refugees, looking after internally displaced uh, communities, and trying to give these communities hope uh, for a better future. But we would like also to send a message, to, del to deliver a message, that the problem in Darfur cannot be seen as an isolated uh, conflict. It is part and parcel of the problem in the Sudan, uh, because the problem, of, the problem of the Sudan is a problem of marginalized and peripheral areas. It's, it's, this, is the, this is the fundamental problem uh, of the Sudan. Uh, and we feel very strongly that the Comprehensive Peace Agreement does provide a model of what, should, of what Sudan should look like, of what Sudan ought to look like. And it's very encouraging. Even though the agreement has not been implemented the way it should, it's very encouraging to see that the Darfur Peace Agreement borrows heavily from the Comprehensive Peace Agreement uh, that was signed in 2005. So this is just, I believe I have to stop here, and I'll be very happy to take questions. <coughs> creating conditions that enable peace, and these may have not been your exact words, creating conditions that enable peace to hold. Uh, and you talked about water, sanitation, agriculture, education, civil society, health. I, I wonder if you could just explain that. I, I, I need to get a better sense of, of what is involved in creating, you know, what do you mean when you say creating conditions like these that enable peace to hold? Explain that. As Father Mike said, uh, Ending conflict, you know, when the guns go silent. This is, this is where the peace building process begins. Uh, and we have seen in the Sudan, we have had uh, ceasefires being negotiated in the Sudan several times. In 1972, a ceasefire was negotiated in the Sudan and the conflict stopped. But the root causes of the problem had not been dealt with. So the conflict erupted again. In 1983. Um, part of the problem in the Sudan is the peace dividends, you know, the things that you've just talked about provision of healthcare, provision of education, food security, agriculture, HIV AIDS, all these things, these are services uh, that we normally take for granted. But in, a, but in a country like the Sudan, these services are not being provided. There is no capacity in southern Sudan. There is actually only 13 miles of paved road in the, in, in the whole south. There are absolutely no roads. Um, there is like, I'm not sure how many of you have been there, but that is what southern Sudan looks like. Now, when you have a, when you have a scenario where a very progressive peace agreement has been signed, and you have a situation where these dividends are not being provided, then it becomes a threat to the peace process. And that is where, that is precisely where CRS, um, uh, uh, that's, that's our focus. Our focus is to ensure that these peace dividends are being provided, to ensure that uh, ordinary people uh, feel confident that their lives have changed uh, after the signing of the, of the peace agreement in 2005. So building schools, uh, it might not necessarily be seen um, uh, as a peace intervention, but it is a peace strategy building schools, uh, CRS trains teachers, uh, teacher training, vocational training, um, provision of health centers, health clinics, agriculture extension workers, these are peace dividends. And uh, for as long as those dividends are not provided, then the comprehensive peace agreement cannot be expected to hold. So that is, that's the link that we draw between uh, the actual signing of the peace process and provision of, uh, of services that are able to ensure that people have confidence in their, in their peace. In your historical uh, analysis, or teaching us a little bit about Sudan here, 
you talked about the two models, uh, the African societal model and the Arab societal model from the fourth or fifth century. And then you showed the, uh, you know, hopefully, you reached a point where those two models were not unified, but sort of somewhat linked. And you said that the concept here is to get to unity so that the country can become unified and become a, a peaceful nation, a sustained peaceful nation over the long term. But you also said that perhaps that might not happen. And if it doesn't happen, it's going to break off back into the same situation that it was in many thousand years ago. That sign of it. Has there been any thought given to the concept that if that unity doesn't occur, and the model does fall apart, and you have an African societal model and an Arab societal model emerge again, has there been any thought given to the fact of simply dividing the country into two separate nations, with an Arab focus in one nation and an African focus in the other nation? Has there been any thought given to that? About the dangers? About the dangers? Uh, maybe just two, set, two separate nations instead of one. Yes, well, Sudan, has always, uh, there's, there's an inherent tension within the Sudan between unity and partition. It has always been there. All the political parties and political movements that have been formed in the country have been an outgrowth of that tension. Um, and uh, because of the historical, you know, you know the, way in which Sudan, uh, the way in which Sudan evolved historically, the northern parts of the country and the southern parts of the country were governed as separate entities. Even during the colonial period, there was no interaction that was allowed between the northern parts of the country and the southern parts of the country. Now, in your typical colonial model, the northern parts of the country were developed, quite highly developed, at the expense of the south. So this uh, Sudan's colonial experience deepened those uh, divisions and therefore heightened it, it, you know, you know, it, you know, it, 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 it increased this this desire for separation. Now, the desire for separation uh, is a reality in the Sudan, certainly among Southerners. It is a reality in the Sudan. It was tried in 1956. It was tried in 1964, and it was tried in 1972. The difference now is that the framers of the CPA, the framers of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, um, had to accept that partition needed to be included as an option, politically. Otherwise, it would have been extremely difficult to have sold this agreement uh, to Southerners because it was tried in 1972 and it failed. So Sudan does have a tension between unity and partition. And if you were to ask me right now, where do we think Sudan will head? It's, 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 you, know, you cannot give a straight answer. But definitely the future of the Sudan is going to be based between those two Models. What the CPA tries to do is to build a vision of unity and diversity, where the two sides of the country can coexist peacefully. But that the success of that model will depend to a very large extent on whether unity is made attractive. Now, if you read the CPA, it does say that even though the Southerners have been given an option of separation, both parties in the interim period must do whatever they can to make unity an attractive option. Now, whether unity has been made attractive is a matter of but definitely Sudan's future is going to is going to rest between those two possibilities. What complicates that is the location of the resources, correct, of, of Sudan? Where, where are all the like, oil resources? And Because I think look what Frank's getting at is, wouldn't it be attractive to just separate and, and avoid the conflict? But the Arab government is not going to let that happen because yes, of where it's, the resources are located. It, it's, a, it's a bit complicated because yeah, you have a situation where the resources are based in the southern part right. of the country. But it's the, the you know the northern part of the country that has the capability of transforming those resources and exporting those resources. So it's not a you know even separation has its own problems because the two parts of the country are going to find are going to need to find a way of coexisting. You know at the end of the day, you know, there's an economic system. reason for they, they, yes. trying to have unity. That's right. That's right. We we just have about one minute left. Yeah. You mentioned something about uh, time frame for uh, this agreement. And you mentioned six years as a uh, time frame for when you might decide uh, to either be unified or, or separate. Was there any consideration to extend that, that time frame? Because it seems as if six years might be kind of ambitious to create that unity that might be needed, given that 
hundreds of years of conflict. Yes, this, this is part of the problem, but that's what the peace agreement says. The peace agreement says that the interim period must be six years. That interim period ends in 2011. Uh, and it says that next year there must be elections. Um, and uh, it would be suicidal to try and, uh, to try and postpone it because uh, it would create political tensions. The Southerners actually wanted to go for an interim period of two years, but it was part of the compromise. Uh, so unfortunately, this is the situation that we have. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Thanks to Paul, we're very grateful.